They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 936, Wednesday, March 30th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And episode two of Better Things is out right now with Randy Moss. Go check it out. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. This is where I feel I have to come up with a really creative joke about Will Smith and Chris Rock. And it should be low-hanging fruit. I can't do it, John. Oh, Bill Finley, you phoned it in the past couple of weeks. <laughs> Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And guys, I have one of the most important races coming up on Saturday. Um, I signed up for a 5K that I'm going to run it. And I breezed in front of the state vet and I'm OK and I have no performance enhancing drugs. God knows that. Um, and I'm hoping to finish and, and run like a mid 70 buyer number is, is what is what I'm going for. <laughs> and then, Joe Bianca, once I do that, I'm calling you and demanding that I get to be a rising star. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably got a better case than some of the horses you asked me about. I, I might. It's not on synthetic. The race is not on synthetic. So I know that immediately. And it's not against New York Reds or anything like that. So, um, yes, it's the, the run of Palooza at Asbury Park on Saturday. So, um, you know, please have, uh, you know, everyone give their, their good wishes and, and positive thoughts um, for Saturday morning. I'll be out there uh, 8 a.m. and hopefully be done by 830. Um, but uh, if if not, uh, they, they told me if you don't finish within three hours, you don't get your T-shirt. So <laughs> shoot it out of a cannon at you. You just shouldn't have a cannon, exactly. <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Mark your calendars for the April Horses of Racing Age sale after the races on closing day of the spring meet, which is Friday, April 29th. Entry deadline for the print catalog is April 1st. That's this Friday. Approved supplements will be accepted until sale date. We are only a week and two days away from the opening day of the Keeneland spring meet. And less than three or less than four weeks away from when the three of us will be down there shooting a show at Keeneland. Just can't wait. Hopefully by then, Bill will have a, a good intro. <laughs> you got all month. You got all oh, month to think God, of one. Thank you. We had two major locales of racing over the weekend, one in New Orleans, one overseas in Dubai. We'll get to both of them. Uh, we had a big day at fairgrounds highlighted by Epicenter, Olympiad. Echo Zulu, even two Emmys had a nice little win in the, in the Muniz Memorial Classic. A lot of good performances. What stood out to you guys? Well, first of all, let's take a look at Dubai. And the story there was more who lost than who won. Uh, and, you know, Country Grammar is a very nice horse. I, I think he's a little bit better than everybody expected. Obviously, Bob Baffert uh, from many, many time zones away in California had to have a huge smile on his face. Not only did he win the race, but he beat the horse that was taken away from him in Life is Good. But, you know, it's hard not to be disappointed in Life is Good, guys. Uh, you know, it, again, you know, hype. The horses have a hard time living up to the hype. You know, we're part of that. We say how great these horses are. I certainly was saying all those things. Um, he didn't, you know, run a, a, a very good race. Uh, he had things his own way on the lead. And then in the last 16th of a mile, he just stopped. You know, the, the obvious conclusion here is that a mile and a quarter is beyond his range. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a great miler. There's nothing wrong with being, you know, uh, able to win a mile and eighth. But, you know, if you want to win the Breeders' Cup Classic, if you want to be, you know, the top contender for horse of the year, you need to go a mile and a quarter. So, you know, that doesn't mean he won't rebound. Maybe we'll see him win something like the Whitney. Maybe he will win the Breeders' Cup Classic. But I, I think he took a step backwards. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we want to talk a lot about New Orleans and what happened there. Epicenter, very good horse. He really looks like he's got a, a chance to give Steve Asmussen his first Kentucky Derby winner. And maybe we want to circle back to it. But I, I was not impressed by Echo Zulu, uh, who ran a career low 88 buyer uh, winning the uh, um, uh, her race to Fairgrounds Oaks. You know, Bill, Echo Zulu, um, you know, that was a race that we had highlighted in, in last week's show and talked about the fact that she was probably going to need one, um, you know, coming off a layoff. And, and, and yeah, she just nosed out Hidden Connection, who, by the way, we did mention specifically on last week's show as, as the horse, uh, you know, that had a sneaky good race, sneaky good fourth last time out um, down in, uh, in New Orleans in the Rachel Alexandra. Um, but I think you have to give Echo Zulu, a, a, you know, kind of a, a pass. And that sounds silly because she won. 
But um, I, I think that was really the whole idea of running her there in, in this race was specifically as, you know, the springboard for the Oaks. Um, and I think mission accomplished. They, they knocked off the rust. They, they kept her undefeated. And, um, and from the one hole, they had to send her, um, you know, and, and I don't know if that's always going to be her style, you know, coming into the, the Oaks. I know she likes to be on or near the lead. Um, but I think you almost have to say she did what she needed to do. She won the race. She's still undefeated. And obviously she's still one of the top contenders, um, for the Oaks. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like an eye opening, um, you know, uh, return to, to racing. Um, but it checked the boxes. She did what she needed to do. Um, Epicenter, I thought you were going to talk a little bit more about not only because the 102 buyer, um, but also Bill, because you picked him in the, in the contest. So, um, I thought that was a good opportunity for you to, you know, pat yourself on the back. Um, actually we had all the first four horses all earned points on our contest. So kudos to, to Bill and, and to Sue, um, and to Al for having Zozos who ran second as well as Rattle and Roll who ran fourth. Um, you know, so the contest is, uh, is getting, uh, you know, really tight. More importantly, who cares about, you know, these, these derby preps? It's the contest that's the important thing. Um, and I'm going to, you know, talk a little bit about life is good also, because you're right. You know, we, we, we put these horses on pedestals because we're so excited when they show this kind of talent. And, and life is good is still a really, really outstanding horse. Um, we talked about, you know, pre-show, we talked about the fact that a mile and a quarter may have just been too far for him. And, and between the mile and a quarter and also the distance he had to travel to get there, to get to, you know, to the races, um, may just have been a little bit too much. Because really, if it wasn't for like the last 40 or 50 yards of the race, um, he would have been the winner. And we still would have been talking about this great, um, you know, potential with him and, and flight line down the road as far as, you know, like the, the Ali Frazier of, of, uh, of, of older handicap horses. Um, can we talk a little bit about the forgotten horse? And that's Hot Rod Charlie. I mean, all he does every single time is just he just hits the board. He just comes in with his running shoes on almost every race. And, uh, and again, you know, had to go overseas, won the prep and, and, you know, looked good in this race as well. So, um, you know, kudos to, to that California horse. Um, and the last race that, that I'll mention, because I know we're talking about all the hot spots in racing, we got to talk about the Sunland Park Derby. Um, and, and, you know, slow down Andy, who, you know, won the race, um, and with blinkers on for the first time. And finally, Finally, got me my fifty pointer for the contest. I was going to say, there's no way John would be bringing up the Sunland Derby if it wasn't a horse that he right, picked. Yeah. In the if it wasn't a horse I picked, or if we weren't running in it, exactly. Otherwise, you know, why? why yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not like it's the Fawner Park Derby. That's true. Um, <laughs> nothing is. Well, I, I, you know, I just got a lot of lot of follow ups from that. I disagree with you guys on Echo Zulu, man. I, as someone who kind of thought she was a little fake as a two year old because she just got in these these races where she got loose on the lead. And, you know, especially in the Breeders' Cup Classic, that only being a six-horse field, I thought that was, you know, relatively speaking, a pretty pathetic field for, you know, a million-dollar race. And the other two horses, the only other two horses on paper that could beat her didn't get out of the gate. So I wasn't that impressed with that. I thought she was kind of a default champion. I was more impressed with this race because, like you said, John, she was off the layoff, and she actually got eyeballed in the stretch. And it looked for a long time like Hidden Connection was going to go by her, and she just would not let her by. So you know me, I like to see brilliance, but I also like to see heart when it comes to horses like that. So I actually, I was more, I was in a way more impressed with that race than anything she did as a two-year-old. You know, am I, am I running to bet her at seven to five in the Kentucky Oaks? No, but I wasn't going to do that anyway. You know, at least now, you know, she showed some guts to where if you're, if, if she gets eyeball at the eighth pole on the Oaks, you don't think, okay, well, this is her first test, you know, and, and who knows how it's going to go. As for Life is Good, that was one of those races where I missed it live. I saw the result and I went back and watched the replay and I was like, how did this horse lose this race? I was like, I was just wanted the race go on and on and on and on and on. He's still clear on the lead. And then just like John said, the last 40 or 70 yards, he, he gave it up. And, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say he can't go in a mile and a quarter just because of that. But uh, but yeah, it definitely leaves some questions as to whether or not he's going to be, you know, the, that top classic contender of someone else is going to end up beating him at a, at a mile and a quarter. Because I imagine that's where they're going to go. He's already won the dirt mile. You know, like you said, he might win the Whitney. I can't imagine that they're going to end up cutting him back for good. They probably will for the Met Mile if that's what's next for him. Um, but, you, you know, I, like I said, I thought Bill would say a little bit more about Ep Epicenter. Like John said, I thought that that was a breakthrough performance for him. Not only because he got a 102 buyer and won really stylishly, but because he showed that rating ability 
that he hadn't necessarily shown in the last couple of preps. And I think that that's so huge because as we've talked about it, one of the running themes on his derby trail is that there are so many front running winners in these three-year-old races. And you're going to need to probably sit a little bit off the pace in the derby. Like I don't think anybody's going wire to wire in this year's derby like we saw last year. And I thought that that was really impressive, the way he was able to switch off. It was a great ride, typically great ride by Joel Rosario. Just angled out the top of the stretch, and he looked like he had them anytime he wanted in the stretch. So I thought that that was super, super impressive. And, you know, again, we don't – has anybody in this three-year-old class run off the charts to where you're like, wow, that is definitely the horse to beat? The only race I can think of like that is Messier, and we're going to see him. That's another story. You know, Bob Baffert's horse is starting to get switched out of his barn, going to Tim Yachtin. I, you know, he's the only one in the Bob Lewis that I thought really ran a race that like really made your eyes pop out of your head. Epicenter, I thought that was the second best race of the three-year-old season after that. So I, you know, I, I was I was definitely very impressed by him. And you know, we got the Arkansas Derby coming up this weekend. We're gonna get to that. But the Florida Derby coming up. So the rubber's really gonna meet the road here in the next two weeks as we get those final derby preps in. And you know, I think I'm excited. I think it's gonna be a really big Obviously, a big field, but an even matched field in the Derby, and you know, I think I think it's going to serve Epicenter well that he was able to rate off of the pace. I think that's going to that, that that's going to serve him well in in, in Louisville for sure. And, and guys, we we missed one. We missed an important race, in, and that's Olympia. Um, and yeah. we're going to talk to Jimmy Roth about about the, about the horse later on. But that was a really impressive race. You know, any to me, anytime a Spikes Town can go long. That means that the horse really has talent because he, he's such a, uh, you know, prolific sire of sprinters. And the fact that this horse won going nine furlongs, which isn't easy. And it wasn't like, you know, he went out there and, and kind of slowed down the pace and everything. I mean, he was sitting off it and you know, he was sitting just off it and, and went by horses down the stretch. And I know he was the even money favorite, but he ran like it. He yeah. ran like he was supposed to. Um, and, and that's a horse that, you know, has taken a little while to kind of fulfill his destiny, but he's, he's going to be a horse that we're going to be talking about as well down the line. Trust me, like I, yeah, I, you know, like we had just talked to Jamie about Olympiad, so he was like out of my mind now. But yeah, no, he's, yeah, you know, my, you know, my feelings on him. He's only running like 102, 103 buyers, you know, relatively speaking in the handicap division. That's probably not going to win the Breeders' Cup Classic. But I don't care. Honestly, like the way he finishes those races is what's yeah. important to me. And he's kind of at the mercy of, of the pace sometimes, you know, if he's, if he's going to go slow, he can only accelerate so much and stop the clock in, in such a fast time. But, you know, he's he's that guy, I think, that's going to kind of creep up on, you know, flight line doesn't make it to the classic or, or you know, life is good, ends up 10 for long, 10 for long is being a little too far for him. I think he's the sneaky horse that uh, if I could get a little bit of a future bet down on him to win the classic, mm -hmm. I would do it because, yeah, he looks really good. And again, just like Epicenter, he had those horses anytime he wanted. Obviously, was not the greatest field in the world, but he was just that was a no doubt win. He's he continues to impress me. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Big weekend for Keeneland September grads with Country Grammar winning the Dubai World Cup. I felt like we only talked about life is good. Country Grammar did win the race and has obviously turned into a very nice, legitimate grade one horse uh, epicenter in the Louisiana Derby. Also Keeneland September grad, Olympiad in the New Orleans Classic, and Echo Zulu in the Fairgrounds Oaks. So those are main, basically the main four races over the weekend swept by Keeneland September grads. We're just over a week away, as I mentioned in the open, from Keeneland, the Keeneland Spring Meet opening next Friday, April 8th. A total of 10 stakes worth a combined $4.55 million are scheduled over the first three days. Opening weekend kicks off with the Central Bank Ashland, John's favorite race, on Friday. Then Saturday has an 11 race card featuring the $1 million bluegrass as well as the grade one Madison Stakes could not be more excited for that. Uh, John mentioned that Coinage is is mentioned is uh, nominated for the Transylvania, right? Yeah, he's going to run in the Transylvania. Actually, Joe, we have uh, we're bringing a, a group of seven horses to Keeneland um, to run in in the spring meet, and uh, you know they're not all stake horses. We have a couple of horses in the allowance races as well, so we're very excited to be able to run for the huge purses. Uh, we're bringing all Kentucky breasts to run the huge purses um, at uh, at Keeneland. Um, Coinage is the only one that wasn't a Kentucky bred, but he's running in the grade three Transylvania. Um, but the other thing I want to mention is that, that we're entering, um, you know, three horses into the horses racing age sale uh, with Taylor made. And, um, you know, Keeneland has provided just a great forum for us to, to sell these race horses. Um, all three of them, you know, one's an American Pharaoh, one's a gun runner and one's a Zoffany, uh, Philly. And, and uh, all of them have hit the board in, in respect of maiden races. And 
uh, you know, we're looking forward to uh, to other people taking them and and having them blossom in, in their programs. One's actually a homebred of ours. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, not only selling at the Horses of Racing Age sale, but attending for our show. Um, and then hopefully, uh, you know, walking away with with some hardware from uh, some of these races. Well, and you can do online bidding. So that'll be harder for me to accidentally bid $600,000 <laughs> on a horse, at least theoretically. But yeah, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. I, I have faith in you. I have faith in you being able to be the underbidder at 600. And, and you know, Joe, if you want, you can buy any of the three horses that we're putting in the sale, you know, for 400,000. All right. You don't have to go all the way to six. Just lend, lend me your checkbook. I'll be glad to buy one. <laughs> Can't wait. All right. We'll be right back after this message from Keemlet. With all eyes on the bluegrass this spring, there's no better way to take in the action than Friday, April 29th at Keeneland. And they're off. We get into it with hip number one. Good luck. Featuring a day filled with world-class racing, followed by a unique sales experience in the evening. The April Horses of Racing Age sale. After the races on closing day of the spring. <laughs> Follow the action this April to Keeneland. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three year old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four year old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Coolmore Sires made headlines at the Facing Tipton Gulfstream Sale Breeze Show on Monday. That show that sale is later today. Cult by Uncle Mo out of a half sister to tap it, but in the fastest furlong work in the seven year history of the Gulfstream Sale, working in nine and three fifths. There's also an impressive cult by Justify out of grade one winner and producer appealing Zofi and a Philly by Practical Joke who both worked in 10 flat. The sale is today, as I mentioned. So I'm sure we'll have some big results to report back on next week for the Stallions at Ashford. And American Pharaoh is the sire of four graded stakes winners on dirt in 2022. That's more than any other sire. Two of his top runners, Mareneath, and as time goes by, just retired. So it'll be interesting to watch as he starts as a new part of his career as a broodmare sire. Those are obviously two very well-bred fillies, especially as time goes by, who race for Coolmore. So we're looking forward to seeing what they produce and what American Pharaoh can do as a broodmare sire. because. God knows he's shown what he can do as a sire, and it's it's a lot. It's a lot. Rain one winners on dirt and turf now, and he's only going to get better. So we had some big news yesterday. This happens. This happens every year around this time. The Jockey Club releases the uh, data from its equine injury database, which you know, as I've mentioned in the show in the past, what we've talked about is such a valuable resource, and is to me the one of the best things that racing has going for it in terms of analyzing and figuring out breakdown data and you know what's what what works what's more risky than other races or you know other distances the overall breakdown rate was 1.39 per 1000 starters that's a slight dip from last year's number which was 1.41 and just for just for context when this when the study started in 2009 it was 2 it was 2 per 1000 starters so that's a big drop over 12 13 years you know, we'd like to see it go down more than it did this year. I think that's basically negligible, 1.41 to 1.39. Some of the breakout statistics are really interesting, including synthetic. The synthetic breakdown rate was 0.73, which is just sparkling. And the, the lowest number of any surface throughout the entire history of the study, the lowest before that was 0.93 on synthetic tracks. So that's super encouraging. There's a lot more data to, to parse here and to, to figure out, but let's get some initial takeaways from Bill and John. Yeah, Joe, we talked about this with the California numbers either last week or the week before. And look, you know, we want it to keep going down and down and down. You know, the, the thing we always say, it's never going to be zero, but let's get as close to zero as we can possibly get. Yeah, the 1.41 to 1.39, you know, that in and of itself is not a major deal. But you look at the bigger picture, like you said, from 2009. And look, you know, we're the first ones to to dump on this industry when we think they're not doing things right. They are doing things right here. This number is very encouraging and we want to see it keep going down. Uh, the other thing that jumped off the page to me um, was in the breakdown that the number uh, for two-year-olds was 0.98. 
And that was uh, so three year olds were one point five two, and old four and older were uh, I'm having trouble reading my handwriting one point three eight. But you hear the argument so often from animal rights people about how awful it is to race two year olds. They're not mature enough. They shouldn't be racing until they're four or whatnot. It's cruel to run these horses. That's just the, the, the statistics just not only don't back that up, they totally refute that argument that two year old racing is not particularly dangerous or more so than any other kind of racing. And in the long run, you know, the, the statistics also show that horses that started as a two year old generally have, you know, healthier careers than horses that don't start as a two year old. So please, you know, people out there, PETA, whatnot, and that horse racing wrongs guy or whatnot, can we please stop with the you can't have two year old racing? It's just absolutely. Absolutely not true. So, you know, good job by the racing industry. And let's hope that when we're talking about this next year, that 1.39 is down to about 1.2. And it's possible. It really is. And, and kudos to the industry and also um, to, you know, we've mentioned this before, to um, the management teams at some of these racetracks, um, because it is a lot of money that needs to be invested into their racetracks. Uh, and, you know, and you'd think that's the most valuable, you know, track of real estate um, on a course is, is obviously racetrack itself. Um, but there, there are racetracks, whether it's Gulfstream, um, that is tearing up their turf course again, uh, because they were concerned about the way that, that, that uh, you know, for safety purposes, amongst other reasons, um, they implemented uh, and installed, um, you know, the Tapita track, which, which has turned out to, you know, statistically has been the, the best and safest racetrack that, that's out there. Um, you know, and then you also have other groups like, like, like Naira, where when it's a frozen racetrack, they'll cancel racing. Um, whereas in the past, and, and Joe, you're 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 you know a big better as well. They would have kind of sloshed through and pushed through and and made the horses run um, those races. So I think you know the pendulum is swinging in the direction of safety, and and certainly management is starting to recognize that it's important to have um, you know these horses alive and 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 well and and uh, you know and and running. Um, you know one of the other things that that Bill, when you mentioned hey the two year olds and, and how important that is that that the statistics show that two year olds in races are the safest horses out there, um, and that is really important. I think the one the the one counter argument I'll make about um, these statistics that that belie I think the the, the overall um, you know numbers is that these are numbers the Jockey Club assembled based on races, um, and we have to remember is that. There's a lot more out there, you know, as far as horses breezing in the morning, galloping in the morning on the various racetracks and even the two year old sales. Um, and I think that until we have those numbers incorporated in these numbers as well, then that'll give us a really, you know, total idea of, of, of the landscape of how safe the racetracks are and also of these facilities. Um, I was glad to see that the two year old sales companies got together and are making headway with regard to safety uh, protocols and medication protocols. And I don't remember, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they had a breakdown at the March sale. Um, and I don't think they had anything at the Miami under tax show. So it looks like that those protocols are, uh, you know, are, are working. Again, I'd love to see, because they are young horses, I'd love to see more stringent rules on that. It scares the bejesus out of me that we're now having all these horses breeze at nine and four and nine and three. Um, especially the young horses, that's, that's, that's a topic for another, another show. Um, but I think overall, we have to be pleased with the way the numbers are for racing. Um, and, and the, and the fact that the, the horses, there's less horses that are dying, um, on the racetrack because that's the most visual part of it, especially for people who, who are casual fans. Um, but I think we need to incorporate all the numbers before we start patting ourselves on the back and saying that we figured this shit out. Uh, just to piggyback off some of the points you mentioned, Bill mentioned the, the two-year-old racing. Some people have made the claim that the decrease in, in breakdowns has something to do with the Lasix bands. And, you know, granted, it's only one year of data, but this the drop in two-year-old fatality rate, to me, would suggest there's there's some truth to that. Because as you remember, the Lasix phase out in America has started with two-year-old races and stakes races. I would be interested to see the numbers split out for stakes races. Now, obviously, those are the kind of horses you would expect the number to be below the median as it is because they're more expensive. You would think more, more sound horses than bottom level claimers, but I'd be interested to see if that number uh, went down as well. And the other takeaway for me, as I said, is, is the synthetic fatality rate because 0.73, you know, that's about as low as you can realistically get. There were 18 
break, fatal breakdowns and 24,742 synthetic starts last year, which is a remarkable number. And to me, that makes me feel good about what Gulfstream has done with the Tapita surface and what Naira might do with Belmont installing a third surface. Um, and I think that's the future, as I've said, you know, obviously not every track has the physical capacity and the facilities to do that. But, you know, I think that's that's the future for all the tracks that do is to have a dirt track, a turf track and a synthetic track. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as I said in the past, when we had the synthetic revolution, the failed synthetic revolution, it was trying to replace dirt racing. And I just that was, you know, it was just kind of this ham handed one size fits all approach, whereas I think there is a place for synthetic racing, but not necessarily as a total replacement for dirt. So overall, for the numbers, 99.86 percent of 264,200 starts in American racing in 2021 ended without a catastrophic incident. And all that being said, as we said, 1.41 to 1.39, not as big a drop as you would like to see, considering where where it was trending. We had gone down like 0.15, 0.15 the last couple of years. Um, and we'll try to we'll, we'll try to put up the numbers too and, and the data because, like I said, the Jockey Club does a great service to the industry, releasing this data and for compiling and releasing this data so we can see where we need to make improvements and, and where we're doing well. So you know, I think that there's there's a lot more work to to do, but I just think as long as that number keeps going down, we're moving in the right direction. I think there's a lot of people in racing that deserve credit for that. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Lane's End. Lane's End Stallion of the Week this week, and what a Stallion of the Week it is, is Tonalist. Son of Tonalist Country Grammar won the Dubai World Cup over the weekend. You should read Chris McGrath has a great story in the TDN this week about Tonalist, about how he's really starting to come on as a sire. He was really, he was he was in that star-studded crop, you know, with American Pharaoh and Constitution. Maybe got a little bit overlooked at the beginning, but now is really starting to come into his own. I think is is great value. Uh, Country Grammar is now a three-time Greatest Stakes winner. Tonalist has also signed a grade two winner, Tonalist Shape. Stakes winner is Sham Rocket and Betsy Blue. Multiple grade one winner. I think he had seven 100 plus buyers in his career. Obviously won the Belmont. Stands at Lane's End this year for just $10,000. But like I said, great value, especially for a sire who just sired a horse who won a $10 million plus race. So definitely go see Tonalist. Uh, if you may have overlooked him in the past because of that, that really star studded intake crop. He's, he's definitely a, a horse with some value. So we'll be right back to this message from Lane's End. Catalina Cruiser. He won seven of nine starts coast to coast with six triple digit buyers and five dominating graded stakes wins, including a record in the grade two true north stakes, a son of leading fifth crop sire Union Rags, a $370,000 yearling with an imposing physical and one of the best of his generation. There's only one Catalina Cruiser now standing at Lane's End. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We are thrilled to welcome this week as the Green Group Guest of the Week from LNJ Foxwoods, Jamie Roth. Thanks so much for coming on. Very welcome. Excited to be on. Great to have you. Obviously, you're coming off the big win from my favorite horse in training. I'm the number one Olympiad, uh, number one Olympiad fan club veteran here. Uh, great win in the New Orleans Classic, coming off another big win in the Mine Shaft. He's a horse that had to take a year off from two to three, and now he's really come into his own over this winter. Can you just speak a little bit about his development and then maybe what's next for him? So he he's always been a horse that showed tremendous ability. Um, he broke his maiden in, at Saratoga in 2020, um, second time out, impressively. It was actually against a good group of horses. Yeah. Can't remember each one, but Brad Cox had a, uh, Cat over river. Cat had a river and there was a bunch of other ones, maybe highest honor, mm -hmm. uh, but he was prepping for the champagne after that. And, you know, unfortunately in racing, you have minor setbacks and we like our stable person likes to take as much time as we can and show patience because we feel that will uh, reward us in the end. And by 2021, he came back, had to come back uh, at Saratoga against a really salty group. I think baby Yoda freaked that day. John same <laughs> Same trainer as us, uh, but he but he ran super off the layoff 
And then he went straight into the cigar, which is, a, you know, it's aggressive move, but that's how much we believed in him. And he ran a good fourth, a sneak, a good fourth. Uh, the ride was, just, it was a little different, I think, than we had anticipated. But at the end, out of nowhere, he, he just made a big run. And I think maybe we hit the board or even run second if things had panned out differently. But we were thrilled with that and dropped back down into an allowance. And, um, you know, from that, from then on, it's, it's been smooth water so far. And like I said, he was a hor- beautiful, well-bred horse that always showed a ton of ability and it's great not just for us, but for the racing world to see what I think he can become. So and just a quick follow-up. Uh, what's the plan for him in, in the next couple of months or so? Well, it sounds like the Alashiba is next, but sure. I'm not the trainer. Uh, things change quickly, but it sounds that that's uh, Bill's plan. And from then on, it's just hoping the horse comes out well. Um, that's always a fingers crossed moment after <laughs> A race, but he's right. We just got his Ragazin number and it was a four plus. So, um, he's trending in the right way. He's not, he's running better numbers, but not so drastic that you have to worry about bouncing. But his numbers line up with top horses, like life is good. Uh, I'm not saying we are that by any stretch, but we're starting to fit into a picture of top older horses. Right. And I'm just so happy for the horse. For me, it's about him showing you know, the racing community his ability. I'm happy he has a chance to do that now. Yeah. Hey, Jamie, thanks for joining us. You're also having a lot of success with a horse that's a very interesting story in Australia by the name of Lighthouse. And we've seen a lot of Australian horses come to the U.S. and prosper. We don't see many go from the U.S. to Australia like this horse has because has become a group one winner. Tell us his well, story. Well, her story is, is story. basically, I think, not I think, LNJ is a very think out of the box operation and try to take advantage of new markets and maybe do things that not everyone is doing. And she was a good horse in the U S she ran, she won the, the grade three at uh, Kentucky Downs, the music, the music. I can't remember the race. All I know is we got. And it, <laughs> no one remembers any of those races. No, no, it was the music. It was the music city. And our trophy, music our city. trophy was a guitar. And it was so, cool. Listen, so I, I like variety in trophies, so I it was kind of interesting, but it's it's kind of great too. But after that, uh, again, just minor setbacks and out of the box, you know, thinking out of the box, we decided to try Australia. And we had already had, actually, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but we already had a few mares down there. Um, a, uh, a mare named Upfront, who's a warfront mare who had a ton of speed, but just couldn't quite get the distance here. I mean, maybe a five for as <laughs> she could. So we know speed's important there. Um, so we had brought her down there and had already had a good experience with communication and we wanted to try something new. We thought she'd fit. Uh, she got a lot of speed and very big, strong body filly and just I think a change in environment was also key. She was a little high strung here and sometimes just you know, doing something new, even going to another country um, can be the trick. And she trains at the beach and she's happy. She swims with dolphins. <laughs> that's for real. And mm. she's a mature, totally different horse. Um, and that was really it. We just wanted to try something different. There's way more, you know, grass options there than, unfortunately, than to say than in the U.S. And that was really it. And she's been great to see her excel. And, and Jamie, as a fellow owner, I've been you know, following Ellen J for a long time and, and watching your success. And one of the things that that, you know, I wanted to ask you has to do with your sales 
um, when you're at the sales. Um, obviously, you guys have bought horses for you know for a lot of money, and more importantly, you've sold horses right. for a lot of money. When when you buy a, a Bellamy Road filly for eight hundred thousand, that's Constellation, and then you turn around and sell her for three point one five million, are you are you more nervous raising your hand at eight hundred thousand, or are you more nervous when she goes in the ring in the Keeneland November sale and, and sells for three million? <laughs> that's a good question. And it's an interesting question. At the Bellamy Road Constellation, we were really new in the sport. Um, I think sometimes people f- forget. We started in 2012, and frankly, I'm still learning something new every day. Uh, there's so much for me to learn compared to people who have been in the sport for much longer. Um, so at that point, it was really Solis, Lit Bloodstock, trusting them. And we have the utmost trust and they love the Philly, loved her breeze. We definitely got a lot of, if you follow Twitter, a lot of flack. Why would you buy an 800,000 Bellamy Road? But you got to believe in your advisors and know that they, be, they have, they have a reason why they bought her. And fortunately for us, it panned out. And in terms of selling her, it wasn't, I wasn't nervous. I knew that she would bring good money. I don't even know. That, I don't even, I think I was surprised, honestly, that she bought 3.1, but she was a beautiful mare. So it's not just about what they do on the race course. It's also, you want to breed out of a beautiful mare. I was more sad to say goodbye. So you mentioned uh, Alex Solis and Jason Lett. You've been working with them for a while. Uh, can you talk about how that relationship came to be and just what your working relationship is, is like? You know, as, as you, like you said, you're still learning. As you learn more about the business, how much input do you have? How much input do they have? Let's talk about their, your relationship with them. So I, anyone who knows my story, it's maybe a little repetitive at this time, but maybe people don't. I, I met Alex in 2000, Alex Solis in 2012. I, had started watching racing before then, but really the triple crown races. I'm a huge sports fan. ESPN is always on. That's my gig. Um, and so I always followed the big races, but then Rachel Alexander came along and it wasn't just the Preakness. It was Martha Washington. It was everything. And as a athlete myself who played on mostly boys teams growing up, cause there weren't a lot of options for me at the level I was at, I appreciated her, you know, her running against the the Colts and Stone Street's desire to give it an opportunity. And so I fell in love with her. At that point, I was a little lost about what I wanted to do in my life. I knew I love sports and animals and really they're the ultimate athlete. So I would happen to have been in Del Mar um, my father actually knows someone who knew Alex. So we set up a meeting. I thought I was meeting his father. So <laughs> I didn't understand. I was a little, so I went into it a little nervous because, you know, in the racing world, he's kind of a star. So I meet Alex Lewis Jr. And we just hit it off. Sometimes you hit it off with people. It was a timing thing. He asked what I wanted to do, how I wanted to get in the business. He said, please say you don't want to win the Derby because it's not going to (laughs) happen. And funny enough, uh, and he came up with a business plan with with Jason very quickly. The plan was to stay on the breeding side, actually, buy well-bred broodmares that are fillies, actually, that if they don't pan on the track, we can fall back on breeding. That happened quickly because I met him in August. September was the Keeneland sale. My parents were all in on the business plan. They've always been supportive of any idea that myself or my brothers brought to them. They would support. So I'm very lucky in that respect. And we bought four mares at Keeneland. And in fact, unbelievably so, they all broke their maiden, which, you know, they could have all not made it to the track. So it started there um, and obviously grew pretty quickly. Uh, my father loves the racing side. So it went from breeding to racing, but still breeding. That's mostly our our thing. But on a data, in terms of what Alex and Jason and now Madison Scott do, really, we let them do their thing. 
we delegate. Um, it's streamlined. I think keeping it close knit, it's just a very small amount of us. They've almost become family. And I think trust in this game and knowing you're being advised to the T is so important. Um, their streamlined service, they do matings, they go to the sales, they speak to the trainers, um, almost, almost everything. And then I speak to them more often than my parents and we make decisions together, but really they, they do most of the hard work and we, then we, then I work with them to make sure we're on the same page and that's really the gist of it. Like I said, I'm still learning, um, but my input is definitely important. Um, you know, we're not going to do something without us all typically being on the same page. So, Gotcha. Hey, Jamie, the um, one of the things that I get a kick out about your operation is the names of the horses. And Kofefi was like the greatest name ever. Um, absolutely. But it seems like, you know, you put a lot of thought and effort into it. You have a little yeah. bit of a mischievous nature, a streak in you. Could you talk about some of the names that, you know, uh, uh, what you've given horses and some of the ones that, you know, you think, yeah, wow, that was well, a good Kofefi name. Well, the Kofefi story just was perfect place, perfect time, right? Um, I actually hadn't reserved the name. A friend of mine in California reserved it for me. Because it happened in the middle of the night, uh, Eastern Standard Time, when the tweet was sent out. The person knew I would get a kick out of the name, reserved it for me. Uh, I did love the name. It, it wasn't, honestly, it wasn't a matter of politics. It was just a funny name. P you know, you could support that name, whatever your political beliefs were. So, you know, we knew Kafefi had this amazing ability. In fact, there was a a decision whether to put her in a two-year-old sale or keep her because, you know, she could have topped this. She probably would have topped the sale had she performed that day, but we could have kept her and it panned out to very little and we took the chance to keep her, but we knew she was talented. The mayor's name was Antics. So we went with that, Antics into mischief and the Fefe just, just worked. But that, you know, it always doesn't. I mean, would the name have been as good if she wasn't good? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. so other names i i believe that good horse bad horse mediocre horse they all deserve good names i i view it as their their license plate um first of all you never know also who's going to end up being the one i mean you could have a horse working six furlongs in the morning great and you know the afternoon they just they don't show up you could have a you know it's it's a difficult game. And so sometimes I give the horse the wrong name that I should be giving to someone else, vice versa. Uh, but like, I loved uh, Dog Tag's name. I thought it was a brilliant name on Diamond Necklace and Warfront. I don't know that many other people would have come up with that name. I'm not sure that a lot of people even realize the connection, um, but I literally spend so much time coming up with names and going on the computer and, and typing in different things, different plays, what, you know, and until finally, and I, I just find it. I, I'm not going to lie. I have the knack for names and yep. you should see my list. It's about 140 names and they're a hundred dollars to reserve a name. So I'd say the jockey club yeah. is pretty right. popular. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the jockey club loves it. Actually, Jamie, uh, you probably know the secret, but um, every year around Christmas time, the jockey club releases 30,000 names. And that's that's Christmas to me. Like I go I go that day and start reserving names, even if we don't have horses for them. That is our favorite day, too. And we break it up into, you know, alpha, you know, different letters of the alphabet. And it is a fun day, but it is a long day. There are a lot of names and What's amazing is how bad so many of the names are. I, I don't even <laughs> right. know how some people come up with it. It's it's almost like some people just put two names together and go with yeah. that. And They've it's right. terrible. Like I yeah, said, every horse deserves a good name, but that is a good day. Right. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a, it's it, it's a, it, it's a great day. I always love that. And and you guys have actually beaten me so, out on a couple of horses at auctions, and you've beaten me on a couple of names also. So. We'll, uh, you know, we'll continue you know, to battle on, on that. About the 
the recently released names list is I usually get, I go through it. I usually do submit them and get most, but there was one this year. I couldn't believe someone got to me before. And I'm just like, who is that person? Who was, who was it? What was who the was, name? Do you remember the name? Oh God, I don't remember the name. It was just a really good name. All you right. probably have it. If you, if you if you see us running, then yeah, then then we can be we can what be partners on it. What I do think would want. be really cool is if you could trade names, like playing card. Right. Yeah. I yep. mean, that yep. would just be like, really cool. Why? Right. It's obvious. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll talk we'll talk about that off air because I'm sure you have 140 names. We have like 100 also. I'm sure we can like mix and match. And you know, you're a sports person, so I'll give you this name for that name and a name to be named later. <laughs> you know, we'll we'll do draft right. picks. We'll, we'll yeah. figure it all out. We'll, yeah. we'll figure it all out. Yeah. I do have one more question for you, though. Um, so back in September, you were one of four new additions to the Keeneland right. Advisory Board, um, Board of Directors. What does that entail and, and what can our audience expect, you know, um, as far as what Keeneland's going to be doing, you know, on the cutting edge for the next few years? So I've only gotten a chance to be on one call. Um, so again, relatively new to the whole experience. So the first call... Honestly, it was, I was pretty nervous given the kind of honor to be on the board. So I was just taking it all in. Mostly it was how can we make the experience better at the sales ground, at race day, um, just kind of floating ideas around. And I don't know what they'll run with, but just an example, they asked about different sporting events you've been to and what you like about those sporting events and how you can, um, and what team we can do better. That's what was really the gist of the meeting. What can we do better? What can we do better at the sales, the racetrack, just to make it a better experience. And truthfully, one of my ideas, I think it's become pretty popular now because of the reality show, I guess it's half reality. I don't know. The Formula One racing. Have you been watching the new show? Drive to... Yeah. yeah. So good. And I've been lucky enough to be at a Formula One race. And the hospitality and, the in- and how interactive you can be with the drivers and on uh, the practice days and just the food, the seating. Every- I- it's just about trying to make it a better experience. And they're... And I think... And I think they, they will, they do. And I think it's going to be a great meet and great meet. I think everyone's excited for warm weather and good racing. So, Yeah. You know, it's funny they they asked us to be on, on one of the boards and the same thing, like, you know, what would you do? And I, I very jokingly said, Oh, well, the minor league game, baseball games, they shoot t-shirts out into the, into the, so maybe we should shoot the jockey silks out. And I never got asked back. <laughs> hey, actually, that's a good I, idea. I like it a lot. Out there. Now hey, it's out I, there. I, now it's I, out I, there. I like the idea too. Listen, I, I think any idea, whether someone thinks it's good or bad, is still an idea. And you never, you never know what, what will stick, what won't. And, right. um, nothing wrong with ideas. But I like I like that uh, that idea. I'll take one of my silks. Yeah, I'll go to Keeneland. I'll get one of those shooting right. guns, and I'll find you in the crowd of all people. <laughs> good. Okay. Good. Yeah. And shoot, shoot your, you know, shoot close right range. I'm sure. You, so, well, not yeah. right at you, so it's not obvious. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can we get Patty and the camera crew to come to okay, record that? <laughs> All right, so yeah. so last question for me. You've had some success in the game. What other races? Royal Alaska? Like you said, you go out of the box. What are you, what are you thinking? Definitely the Kentucky Oaks. I mean, you know, as a woman, and that's how I got into racing. To me, that that would be just amazing. Um, the Breeders' Cup Classic. I, I think the Breeders' Cup races are, you know, it's the Super Bowl. Of racing uh, as winning lucky like being lucky enough to win one and receiving that trophy and the pride I had actually you know what winning a grade one with a homebred right and that that would be yeah, amazing and man we, I was so so close in the Rodeo Drive maybe if the setup was just or me you know a little bit different but to me we still started as a breeding operation. So it's not as much about what race, but I would love to win a great one with uh, with a homebred. Yeah, 
a full circle. Yeah, right. So yeah. I, yeah. I have one more, Jamie. Yeah. Just again, as a as a fellow owner, <laughs> you know, we try to be ambassadors for the sport to people who mm -hmm. aren't in the game. Um, and you know, the past couple of years have been tough um, as far as you know, friends and and people coming up to me and asking me about racing, and 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 there's such a kind of a cloud over it. How do you handle that situation when, when you try to be ambassador of the sport and the general public has this kind of, you know, bad taste in their mouth about our industry? For me, it started kind of on a, not to avoid the question, but on a different level, when I got into the sport, a lot of people were surprised because they look at horse racing as, I don't want to say cruel, but to some extent cruel that they don't realize horses want to run. Horses love to run. They like their job. And that was hard to explain to people. So that was the first issue I had. Uh, at the end of the day, I believe in myself and I, I have to know what I'm doing is what I believe in. If I didn't, I wouldn't do it. But that it started there for me, which was <laughs> kind of tough because uh, they don't realize these horses have incredible lives. And if you have good ownership behind the horses, whether they're good, not good. Let's be honest. Most horses just aren't very talented. We are so into finding them a good home and making sure they're well taken care of. On to what, not the elephant in the room, the, the drug issue. Um, no, I think I'm out, as pretty outspoken to some degree. I think it's a problem. I think not just for, for betters, um, even, uh, no, even as a breeder, uh, you ha say you happen to be in a race and there's some kind of positive that can cost my horse the difference between being a grade one winner, a stakes winner, um, a listed winner. And then I go to sell a, uh, a daughter or a colt and that difference in their value because they don't have black type is significant. So on a level as a breeder, that is, important to me. I don't know how many people see it as that way. I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very confusing, tough situation and it has to find a way of working itself out else. I think we're all in a, in a, a big, a lot of trouble. That's all I can say about it. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. Congratulations on Olympiad, thank all the recent you. success. And Good I'm to glad talk you had me on. I watched your show and you know, it, you know, it's nice. I feel important to be asked. Thank you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I my we appreciate you being on. You know, like, okay. <laughs> no, you're good. Well, you're good. Really hopefully good. Uh, we'll see absolutely. Olympiad in another winter circle or maybe even Lighthouse in the winter circle in the Doncaster. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Jamie Roth, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year-round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads. Breed them. Raise them race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders. Kentucky Breds dominated on the world stage this weekend with Country Grammar taking the $12 million Dubai World Cup, giving Kentucky Breds back-to-back -back victories in the race 
And then Switzerland, who used to run in America, won his first Group 1 in the $2 million Golden Shaheen. They both earned their breeders a $7,500 KBIF bonus. You can find your next Kentucky bred at the upcoming two-year-old sales later today. You can get in. Basic. Uh, Keeneland and Churchill's meets are coming up. Definitely a lot of good bonuses out there, as John mentioned before. So but get involved if it's Kentucky breads, if you haven't already. All right, so Bill reported on this last Friday. Uh, Naira has banned six trainers, including Wayne Potts and Juan Vasquez, who are two pretty toxic names in the business, I would say, uh, from stabling at Belmont Park. Their horses must be off the grounds by today. It says, however, all six will still be permitted to race at Naira tracks, at least for the time being. Now, that might be a little bit of the result of the whole Bob Baffert kerfuffle that they don't want to go through all these legal proceedings with banning these guys from racing at the Naira tracks. Um, says Bill, quoting Bill's story here, Naira's decision to not outright ban the trainers stems from a ruling issued in the Bob Baffert matter last July by the United States, States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. The court ruled that trainers cannot be banned at the Naira tracks without due process, starting with a formal statement of charges. So, yeah, they're going to have to go through a whole process to get rid of these guys. But what I thought was interesting, too, is that beyond Wayne Potts and Juan Vasquez, who a lot of people have a lot of suspicions about and guys who have failed a lot of drug tests, not even just suspicions. The other four trainers were low percentage guys that I, you know, I, I didn't understand. It was like John McAllen and, and Michael Simmons and like these very low percentage, low profile guys. Uh, Bill, what did you make of this? Well, uh, it's an interesting story. And Naira for years really, you know, wasn't proactive about this sort of thing at all. And now they've done a 180 degree turn and, and good for them. Uh, Joe, first of all, they because Potts, Vasquez and the rest are still able to run, that doesn't mean that they won't eventually give them this hearing. They have to. The judge basically said in the Baffert thing, you can't throw somebody out without a hearing. Now, the Baffert hearing is still not have been decided yet. They haven't even started the Marcus Vitale hearing. So, I mean, obviously, if they want to give hearings or, or to these guys in an attempt to boot them for good, it's going to be something that probably can't happen for several months down the road. So, you know, this is an interim step. Uh, it's a little awkward that you say the guy's not welcome to uh, stable here, but he can race here. But I, I think their hands were were tied on that. So so far as Juan Vasquez and, and Wayne Potts, their futures uh, in the New York Racing Association tracks uh, may be that they will not be able to race. The other part of it is what was it was such a strange group because there were six trainers and we have these two big names. I didn't even heard of the other four guys. Um, they were all, you know, extremely low percentage trainers. And um, Dave Grenning wrote this. I did not because with one of the trainers that that they were concerned that he wasn't properly taking care of the horses. Um, I, I I think that it's a fair to make an assumption here that that was probably the case with all these guys. A guy winning going one for 52 in a year is not somebody who is cheating. I mean, that's just not happening. So, you know, stay tuned. There's more to come from this. But yeah, a, a Naira deserves credit for this. And, uh, you, you know, especially when Marcus Vitale ran at Saratoga last year, that left such a bad taste in my mouth. And, you know, their hands were tied. You know, it's been a long time since Saratoga, but they're trying to deal with this on a case by case basis. And, you know, it is it is an example of, of, of a racing jurisdiction being proactive and doing what we've been saying they should be doing, not just Naira, but all these racetracks. You know, you don't get 52 chances in this. Yeah. Sport. You know, after some point in time, you just have to say to these guys, you're not welcome here to participate. Goodbye. Uh, good luck with the rest of your life. And, you know, in a very slow process, that appears to be what Naira is trying to do. I love the fact that these racing management teams are, are coming in and, and sweeping out, you know, the, the, the dead wood, um, whether it's because of, uh, you know, horses that aren't being cared for um, or these guys are, you know, way behind on their on their bills. Or in this case with with Juan Vasquez, who has, according to thoroughbredrulings.com, 125, 125 violations. Now, again, some of them are you know, for jockey club papers not being in, in on time or for the, you know, for their uh, silks not being, you know, uh, in the jocks room, you know, in advance. But a lot of them are um, infractions. They're, they're drug infractions. And, uh, you know, when you have guys like that, you have to look from a management standpoint. You don't want them representing your brand. You know, and I steal that from the NFL about, you, you know, you're, you're every time a, a trainer enters a horse and an owner enters a horse, they're representing that racetrack. 
Um, because if something negative happens, it's always associated with the racetrack. So kudos to, to Naira for getting rid of guys like, um, you know, v- uh, Juan Vasquez and, and Wayne Potts. And, and, you know, I remember very distinctly when we interviewed Sal Sinatra, who at the time was, uh, you know, one of the head honchos at, at, at for Maryland. And sp- ironically enough, it was specifically on Wayne Potts. And he was like, we don't want people like that at a racetrack. We just don't want those guys here. Um, and, and thankfully, these guys are running out of jurisdictions to run their horses in because because management, you know, are being proactive on this stuff. So I'm really happy that Naira has, has you know, taken a, a stand with these trainers and saying, we don't want you here. And and I know they, their hands are tied legally. They have to let them run here. But if you're if you're like Wayne Potts or, or Juan Vasquez or any of the other four guys that were on the list, um, do you really run horses in New York at this point? I mean, you know what kind of scrutiny you're going to be under? Um, you know, and, and what kind of, uh, you know, not only from the vets, but also from the testing and, and, you know, when you ship in, where are you shipping in? You're probably going to get the, the really, you know, crappy barn. I, I mean, it's better off for these guys just to stay home, um, you know, in whatever safe haven they feel, you know, comfortable with because they're, because of their own actions, they're running out of places to run. Yeah. I mean, as, as John mentions, uh, Wayne Potts and also, uh, one of the things, one of the other trainers that was, uh, banned from stabling there is Bonnie Lucas, who was an assistant for Wayne Potts. So that's been another problem is that you ban a trainer just puts all of his horses in another trainer's name and it can still run effectively. And Potts and Lucas were suspended for 30 days last year by the New Jersey racing commission. Remember Pot Wayne Potts had that whole thing with the, uh, with the, the claiming violation last year at Saratoga. Potts was banned from the Maryland tracks in 2020, as John referred to. Sal Sinatra told him to get the hell out. Uh, that was amid allegations that he was a paper trainer for for the incredibly toxic Marcus Vitale. And I just wanted to read Wayne Potts' quote here. It says, I was shocked when they told me I wasn't being allocated stalls. I supported the Naira circuit strong through the last two winters when they have short fields. If this is an act to clean things up, there are other people that should be gone before myself. I don't have a whole list of medication violations. Okay. I have done some stupid things in life, but there are other people that have done much worse than I have. That isn't really a denial. Honestly, he said the whole thing. I would have had a bunch of medication violations. Well, yes, you have. But also like, why are you coming for me? There's other people that are worse than me is not, is not a denial. And the thing he said about the stalls, he kind of gave away the game there, which is that the, a lot of these guys have, you know, kind of, uh, under the table agreements, I think, with certain tracks and jurisdictions that, you know, we won't bust you if you fill stalls and fill races for us, especially in the dead of winter. And I think that's how a lot of these guys get to keep doing what they're doing. And, you know, kudos to Naira for saying, you know, honestly, we don't we don't really care that you're that you're filling stalls for us. There are certain people that are are, are too toxic and too dangerous to have on our grounds. And, you know, hopefully there are proceedings like Bill said that are coming to where they can ban them from racing at the tracks. Cause right now it's a little bit of a toothless uh, ban, but you know, they, like you said, like we said, they can't necessarily ban them outright right, right away. But yeah, like Wayne Potts and Juan Vasquez, no, there's no secrets that those guys are doing things that they should not be doing. They have the whole, they have the list of they have the rap sheet to prove it. As John mentioned, you know, this is something that like, like you guys say, they eventually they're going to run out of jurisdictions to race in, except for maybe a few small ones in, in this country. You know, I'm looking at you, Turf Paradise, for letting Marcus Vitale still run there. But yeah, this is, you know, we, we talk so much on the show about, you know, the, the patchwork system of enforcement and regulation that we have. But when you have the main tracks starting to do the right things, then I think that that becomes more of an effective unified front against people like this. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV workout of the week this week, as you can see on the screen right now, is Kentucky Derby Hopeful Forbidden Kingdom, who worked in company with fellow Richard Mandela trainee Charlito last Thursday, going six furlongs, one minute, 14 flat. The son of Coolmore, Ashford Stallion of American Pharaoh, is aiming for next Saturday's Run Happy Santa Anita Derby. Cannot wait to see him in there clashing with Messier. It's going to be a great race. If you want to see their works, check out xbtv.com. You can see all of the Derby contenders leading up to the May 7th Derby. We'll be right back after this message from XBTV.
all the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. West Point had an exciting winner last week with Kadama, a three-year-old filly by Kodiak, a broker maiden at Gulfstream for Christophe Clement. And uh, West Point still has a couple two-year-olds available from their purchases at the OBS March sale. I'm sure they'll be very active today at the Facing Tipton Gulfstream sale. You can check out all of their available horses at westpointtb.com. Okay, so we got some great action on the on the three-year-old front this weekend with the Arkansas Derby and the Florida Derby. We're going to get to that and do a little bit of a preview. But before we do that, we're going to throw up the current standings for our Derby Chase three-year-old fantasy stable contest. Uh, from last week, we ran one, two, three, four in the Louisiana Derby. And Bill Finley is riding Epicenter all the way to the top of the standings. Epicenter now has 150 total points. So Bill is in front with 200. Uh, Al is in second. He had Zozos in the uh, run second in the Louisiana Derby. He's got 110 now. I'm in third. Did not have any action last weekend. Got 90 points. Uh, John has leapfrogged Sue and moved into fourth out of the basement. Uh, he had slowed down Andy in, in the Sunland Derby, so he's up to 55. And Sue has 25. Pioneer of Medina still holding strong for her. So we still got a lot of action to go, including obviously the Derby on May 7th. Um, but this weekend, we've got the uh, Florida Derby and the Arkansas Derby. Lots of action for all of us in there. Um, in the Florida Derby, we don't have the actual entries yet, but we're going to go based on the probables. I have Classic Causeway and White of Barrio, so two-pronged attack for me this weekend in the Florida Derby. Uh, Al has Simplification. Bill has Papa Cap. Uh, John has Charge It, and I believe I believe that's it in the uh, Florida Derby. But, you know, in terms of watching for big storylines, the storyline is going to be in the Arkansas Derby with Secret Oath running against the boys. And, you know, just looking at the field, I stand by what I said, that it makes total sense for her to run in here. No horse in the race other than her has run a 90-plus buyer. When's the last time you saw an Arkansas Derby going into it? Nobody had run a 90-plus buyer. So she's going to be favored. She's probably going to be a heavy favorite in that race. So that makes that race more interesting. But also it makes the fantasy earlier in the card more interesting, too, because she would have been one to nine in that race. So both of those races are more interesting. And we're going to they were all going to root for the Philly, um, you know, just just because of what a great story it is. And we want to see her run in the Kentucky Derby. And obviously, if she wins this race, we think she's going to go there no matter what Wayne Lucas and the owners say. What are you guys looking forward to this weekend? You know, I'm, I want to see what Classic Causeway does, because to me, he's the enigma of this three-year-old class. Uh, you know, he's looked really good in his races, but, you know, it was Tampa Bay Downs. It was not exactly grade one company. And also his buyer numbers are not very good. Um, and I'm really glad that Brian Lynch is putting him in the Florida Derby rather than, you know, sitting him on the bench in between the Tampa Bay Derby. And, and the Kentucky Derby, because I think that's the best way to manage the horse. Uh, you're going to be one of the favorites in a million dollar race. And, and we're going to find out something about him. You know, I could see him winning. I could see him, you know, proving that he's just not quite good enough uh, against White Iberio and Simplification. So I'm looking forward to that. And you know what? I hope Secret Oath wins by 15 lengths and goes in and is the biggest buzz uh, at the Kentucky Derby that we've seen in, in years. And, uh, you know, I actually talked to Wayne Lucas about this earlier in the week, and I'm, I'm going to write something about this. Boy, does horse racing need mm. this. Uh, you know, with all the negativity and all the bad stories we've had, this is going to be the feel. If she goes in the Kentucky Derby, it's going to be the feel good story of the decade. And, you know, Wayne Lucas is the perfect guy to be behind this with his stature, his iconic status and, of course, his age at 86. So, you know, that's what I'm I'm. And I agree, Joe, uh, Joe. It, it, you know, it, the Arkansas Derby, we haven't seen Arkansas Derby come up this week in years. It's been such a strong prep. You know, Baffert always supports it a uh, big time. And yeah, I, I mean, what a no brainer to put her in there. She's going to be six to five for one point two five million dollars with a trip, presumably to the Kentucky Derby on the line. 
I'm just going to focus primarily on the Arkansas Derby because you guys, you know, again, we're waiting to see exactly who's going to be running in the Florida Derby. And you guys have hit on all the major points. Um, but you look at the Arkansas Derby and, and, and you say, okay, it's a grade one. There was a horse in here who got claimed for 50,000. There was another horse in here who ran and won for maiden 30. Um, you know, you have a couple of other horses that, that not only haven't, you know, broken 90 on the buyer numbers, but they're, they're, they're scrambling to get through 80. Um, which at this stage of the game is not good enough to, to be in these, you know, in these preps, uh, you know, and, and then some other interesting stories. You have the first horse of, uh, of, of Tim Yachtin coming in. Um, and that's doppelganger for SF racing and, and starlight racing and at all and taking the blinkers off and running for the first time out of the Bafford barn. Uh, obviously, you know, the horse was out there all the way through March 26th when it breezed at, at Santa Anita. So, you know, it really, in essence, it really was Baffert trained, um, you know, as it's coming into the Arkansas Derby. You have Unoho, who at 75 to 1, you know, went by everyone in, in the Rebel. Um, you have obviously Secret Oath, who's the story of, of, amongst stories. And then you also have the, the, the jockey shuffle, which I thought was really interesting because um, Florent Giroux sticks with, uh, you know, Cyber Knife, but that means that he's, you know, for, for Brad Cox. But that means he's taking off We the People, who was undefeated in two starts. So Flavin Pratt is is going to ride We the People. Well, he's taking off Doppelganger. You know, so so it's like it's like this really weird, you know, kind of jockey juxtaposition um, as far as you know what what's going on. It, it, to me, it comes down to like you guys said, Secret Oath. Um, I would love to see this Arrogate Philly, you know, win. I think all of us are rooting for her to win. And, you know, shame on me because Skip Anderson, I asked, you know, faithful fans, Skip Anderson back in February, if he had any insight on a long shot to pick. And he actually told me secret oath. And I was like, uh, I even said, there's no way that, that, that a Philly's going to be doing this. But you know what, Skip? I know you're listening. You were 100 percent correct, buddy. You were 100 percent correct. This Philly may have the inside track um, and and maybe would have won me the contest if, uh, you know, if, if I only I was had the balls enough to, to actually pick her. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, other than we the people, Doppelganger and her, there's really nobody to get super excited about in that race. And shout out to Skip for picking her out early. It's a great job by him. Can't wait to see his horse on the track, John, too, also later this year. Um, stay on our good side. But yeah, with Secret Oath, like like Bill says, it's such a great story. And it also makes this race race worth watching. Like, I honestly would, would not really be that interested in, in watching the Arkansas Derby this year if it weren't for her. She's appointment viewing. And I think that'll transfer to the Kentucky Derby, like like you guys are saying, that it would be such a great story if she goes in there that someone who may not watch the Derby on you know on a regular basis every year will hear that there's a Philly in the race and will tune in to see what happens. So we're rooting for her and hopefully you see her in, 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 at Churchill Downs in five weeks hence after this race. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Summer yearling deadlines will be here before you know it. The deadline for Keen on September is May 2nd. Facing tip in July in Saratoga is May 6th. And then the deadline for the facing tip in New York bread sale is May 13th. Give Tommy or Wendy a shout to discuss your plans for those sales. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. We are nine days away from the Keeneland Spring Meet opening up. And don't forget about the Keeneland Horses of Racing Age sale, which is Friday, April 29th. Entry deadline is this Friday, April 1st. You can enter those supplements up to sale date. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, and Green Group Guest of the Week, Jamie Roth, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.